Mm. Hello there, welcome everyone to the latest edition of The Front Page. They reckon that the opening week of the year is the most boring. That is not true in the racing world. There is Christmas cake still in the tin and already we've had another instalment in the sport's endless whip saga and revelations about a derby winning owner who hasn't paid for his horses. Also big questions facing the sport in 2023 therefore much for you to engage on on youtube and please do like comment share and subscribe as we go through the program introduction time now first to my immediate left the racing post industry editor bill barber bill you're always working always writing and it's a difficult old job and you're also a Leeds United supporter, which was quite um, quite stressful, I believe, over the weekend. Well, yes, I came back from Christmas holiday mm. last week, trying to catch up on all the things that have been going on yes. um, over Christmas. And yeah. this week has been, as you say, very busy indeed. Um, and I sat trying to do that yesterday afternoon while my football team put me through agony and shaved a few more moments from my lifespan. So, yeah, but we're, we, we live to fight another day. And you're still in the cup. Yes, which is which lovely. is very rare. For Isn't it? Yes. That's great. It's and great Jonathan Harding, specialist writer of the year. Your beloved Arsenal play this evening against Oxford, but I'm not very good talking about football. So instead, I'll ask you about your trip to uh, Exmoor last week. Yeah, me and our photographer Ed Whitaker went for a lovely evening away together in Exmoor to see Mickey Martin and Welsh Grand National winner, the two amigos. So it's good to get some fresh air and see her. She's only got a small yard, but punching well above her weight at the moment, so that will be published on Friday, all being well. Excellent. There is that to look forward to. And if you are looking forward to maybe having a horse for Royal Ascot this year, for Coventry's sake, to Queen Mary or the Dewhurst later in the year, there is still a chance for you to acquire a regally bred two-year-old that wasn't sold at last year's uh, sales, or was sold at last year's sales, but hasn't actually now been sold at last year's sales. Sounds complicated. My story is complicated, so complicated, that I've got somebody else to present it for me. Our Deputy Industry Editor, Peter Scargill, is at home. Hello, Peter. Morning, Lee. Nice to see you all. You too, sir. Um, Pete, you have been uh, breaking uh, stories as usual, and on Saturday, uh, you broke a particularly big one when revealing that a certain Derby winning owner is at the centre of a huge bloodstock story. Tell us more, please. What a shamble this is, Lee. Um, so, through the yearling sales last year, um, obviously the one-year-old horses who will be now just turned two, um, there was a big new mystery spender spending huge sums of money um, through a bloodstock agent named Richard Knight. Um, their crown jewel through the whole period was buying Blackbeard's sister. Blackbeard, we'll all recall, won the pre morning in the Middle Park last year for Aidan O'Brien, now retired to stud. Uh, they paid just over £2 million uh, for that horse. Um, they bought um, around about 30 horses in, in total, Richard Knight and his mystery client. Um, we revealed in October that the mystery client who Richard Knight would not name and that, that everybody seemed to know but wouldn't name was a gentleman named Salah al Hamazi. If that name sounds familiar, it's because Salah al Hamazi uh, owned Authorised. He gave Frankie Dottori his first Derby winner in 2007. Um, lots of other good horses as well um, during his period in, in ownership with Imad al Sigar, who's now gone his own way as Holly Doyle as his retained um, jockey. Um, so we named Salah al Hamazi, um, but it appears when uh, the, the bill has arrived on his doorstep to pay for these horses, uh, £20 million worth of horses roughly. Um, he's not been able to settle that bill, which has caused um, quite a lot of consternation in sales houses and a lot of head shaking from us on the outside. Pete, do we know, um, this is a daft question, but do we know what's happened in terms of why he hasn't paid for these horses? <laughs> it depends on how much, um, how much stock you're putting in, in various rumours. I mean, this has been a story that's been fueled by very strong rumours all the way along in terms of who it was that the horses haven't been paid for. Um, there are numerous reasons being put forward as to why this hasn't happened. Um, what There must have been some kind of agreement put in place, some kind of assurance provided to people like Richard Knight and the sales houses. I don't know what that was, um, but for whatever reason, these horses were bought on credit and whether 
Mr. Alhamezi thought he was due some money, whether he was fronting a syndicate, whether um, there's been some kind of falling out that means he can't get hold of the money that he was due to have. I'm not entirely sure, but the simple fact of the matter is the horses haven't been paid for. It's gone beyond the the period the sales companies are prepared to wait. And these horses are all up for sale again, either privately or, or publicly, which is um, very awkward and, and, you know, sort of scandalous in a way, really. Well, absolutely. Um, obviously, Pete, the, the, the sales scene, the, 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 the sales ring has been the subject of many um, big stories, investigative stories in recent years. Here's another one. I suppose it, it raises a number of a number of questions, this. I mean, you described it as a scandalous what's happened. Just outline from your perspective why it's scandalous and I suppose out, outside from Mr. Al um where the fault lies. Well, it's, it's scandalous because essentially someone's been allowed to run up a £20 million bill with very little assurance seemingly to, to get it. I mean, if you and I went to try and buy that amount of horses, would we be able to run up that sort of bill? I know it's not necessarily apples for apples in that scenario, but the situation is is that this this has been facilitated, this has been allowed, and it sort of smacks of slightly, um, you know, a lack of thoroughness, a, a, a willingness to um, get the cash in, or, or, you know, theoretically get the cash in, without wanting to, to put the rigour to it. It's 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 troubling because it's distorted the market i mean if somebody comes in and, and is blasting 20 million pounds around at the sales that's you know that's forcing up averages that's allowing um you know that's gaining commission that's forcing people to alter their behavior that's affecting people further down the food chain um you know richard knight for salah hamazi was the second highest spender at the tattersall's book one sale he was only behind Sheikh Mohammed. I mean, we, we had a story uh, in today's paper with Charlie Fellows um, saying that he wasn't able to buy the horse that he most wanted from the sale. Um, and now his owner's gone and bought a football club, um, as you do. But the, the point is that that horse, if Charlie Fellows had been able to buy it, had the potential to add a real boost to his yard, really move things on. And he was in a position where he couldn't do it and the moment's gone. So it's it's not really... You know, there's no, there's no veracity of the market if someone can come in and do this. What, where's the, where's the belief in what you're seeing is real? Where is the fairness if someone can come and run right like this, and then a few months later go, ah, sorry lads, I've actually not got any money. Um, you'll have to sell the horses at the February sale or something else like that. It, it undermines the foundations, um, and you know, whilst the ultimate issue is with the person who's not paid for the horses it asks questions of the person who was buying the horses on his behalf and on the people who were allowing them to spend. It's, it's, it's so laissez-faire and, and there's just not enough rigour in it. And it, it. It can't be. This has to be a watershed moment for the bloodstock industry. This is huge. £20 million they spend. Can you believe £20 million and I haven't got any money? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I, we, we, we've had quite a few what we thought were watershed moments for the bloodstock industry in the past. Let's hope this one actually is a watershed moment. And in terms of the lacy fair aspect to it, Pete, obviously by the time um, Richard Knight got to uh, Tat's book one, um, he'd already spent a huge sum of money on behalf of this undisclosed client. Now, assuming the client's name was disclosed to the sales houses, shouldn't Tat's um, have been asking questions about whether this guy actually was good for the money. You know, someone who hadn't, as far as we're aware, been active in the market for, what, four years, um, with an agent who certainly wasn't accustomed to spending that sort of money at the sales, why would they not have asked questions about, can you actually pay for these horses? Well, seemingly they did ask some questions. I mean, <laughs> we, we were told that, um, you know, they, they ticked the boxes in terms of uh, the checks run on buyers, which um, led to one wag telling me that they probably need to get themselves some new boxes to be ticking. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's, I mean, there was some nervousness around, from Tats, I understand, when Richard Knight turned up in the first place, but they were provided with some sort of reassurances. I don't know what that was. I don't know whether that's a phone conversation with Salah Hamazi. I don't know if that's bank statements. I don't know if it's some sort of written bank guarantee. Um, I mean, and presumably Richard Knight would have had these as well. I mean, Richard Knight had a very good reputation going into this. I mean, the, the irony is that 
he probably got the job. He was recommended for the job because he had a good reputation of being fastidious and a good judge and does things by the book. He lodged all the appropriate paperwork saying, you know, I'm, I'm an authorised agent. I'm buying for this person. You need to bill him and all of that sort of thing. Um, and he obviously set up a company with Salo Alpha Maze, the SYH Bloodstock, which we reported on last year. So he must have had some some level of reassurance. But but what was it? I mean, what what was rigorous enough in their dealings that made them think, yeah, that that's fine. We'll give them this level of credit. And if it's just, um, you know, yeah, those documents look fine. We know you from before because you had authorised and you used to pay your bills. That's fine. Um, it's just, it's it seems too easy and too willing to have somebody come in and do this. I mean, if he wanted to come in and spend a million pounds, would it have been different? Was it because they were spending such large sums that they thought, well, we'll give them every chance to do so because that's beneficial for everyone involved? I suppose we should stress, Pete, that the, the sales houses have paid all the vendors. The, the, the people who sold the horses, they've got their money, haven't they? Correct, yeah. As per the, the terms of the sale, I understand that they, they have to do that. Um, although in the terms it actually says that they don't have to if they haven't been paid. Um, so all the vendors have been paid out. Um, Richard Knight probably isn't on the hook for the horses. Um, Salah, or mate, well, the horses will be resold and then any difference they'll have to retrieve somehow. Um, I understand they're already eyeing up property that Al Hamazi might own in Newmarket uh, and, and maybe getting some payment through that means, possibly. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that everyone's been cavalier and they've just let, let someone roll in with, with no checks, but, but whatever it is, it, it's not strenuous enough. It's too, it's, they're too willing to, to get these in and, and it's distorted the market entirely. Um, it's, it's, put, it's forced people to change their, what they're doing, their decisions, um, driving up commission in places. Um, reputationally, it doesn't do the sales companies particularly well. And, you know, it's, it's not the same. But like you say, there have been other scandals where people have turned up seemingly with large amounts of money. Um, and that money's either been illegitimate money or it's not been there. Um, you know, you, you can't come into a position where this happens, where somebody spends £20 million on credit, um, whatever reassurances they've given aren't worth the paper they're written on, and then just say, ah, you know what, that was a shame. Um, let's hope it doesn't happen again. We'll, we'll carry on agents and the sales company and everyone involved in this needs to really pop on after after this episode. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Going to come back to you, Pete, for a couple more questions before we move on to the next subject. But guys, um, Jonathan, Bill, it's one of those stories that when, when you read, you think that can't possibly be true, but it clearly is. Um, can, can you make sense of it, Bill? Um, it's... It's a, it's a, it's an amazing story, really. Um, it, the, the, the issue that sort of springs to my mind is, it, it's just we, we've, we've obviously had the bloodstock review, and it's another. It just gives the, the impression that it's, it's a sector that's that's sort of ruled by almost un, there's an unwritten code to it mm -hmm. almost, and you know we're in a, a period when we want to, for instance, we want to. Uh, re retain owners and we want to attract owners and events like this just will sow sort of seeds of doubt in people's minds just about uh, again about the about the process of buying buying blood, blood stock is, is something I'd, I'd be worried about. Well it. absolutely and I link to that um, John even if you're someone who bought a, uh, a horse in combat with with Mr Alhamazi at the sales if he was the underbidder you ended up paying more for your horse then you should have paid. Yeah, it just distorts the whole picture, doesn't it? And you want to go in any market, let alone a bloodstock market, any market, you want to be going in thinking, well, this is a level, fair, transparent, sensible playing field that I'm going to be investing into. And if it's being sort of put out of kilter by somebody who's able to come in and spend 20 million pounds and seemingly <laughs> walk away with the horses without actually having to pay for them, well, obviously we've got to this point, but without having to immediately pay for them or prove that he ha can pay for them or sign something that, you, you know, it just feels to me that there's a, there's a systemic issue here, not so much, we can't get too caught up on the individual case. It seems to me the checks and balances that are in place can't be rigorous enough if this has happened. It's not a case of this is a unique scenario and 
we'll go back to doing things how we, we were. Um, this is the canary in the mine, really, that says the system isn't quite rigorous enough. If somebody can walk in and chuck £20 million at it, distort the market, and we end up here. Yes, absolutely. Well, and, and linked to that, Pete, two final questions that spring from what both Bill and John have said there. One, this surely highlights the, the astonishing lack of transparency that exists around these, these bloodstock sales. But secondly, that whole sales industry, the bloodstock industry, they, they've always been adamant, all through that, uh, the, the, the Justin Felice review, before and since, that they are very successful and good at self-regulation. On the transparency front and the self-regulation front, what does this all tell us? Well, on transparency, I mean, the whole it's a mystery buyer, I can't tell you who it is, all the way along was unsettling for me. Now, look, I'm nosy and I like to know who's spending large amounts of money at the sales, but it seems slightly strange that you can get in this position where you don't know who's buying these horses. I get that somebody might want some level of anonymity, but at this extent, um, I'm not sure that should be that should be permitted. I mean, Richard Knight's actually not named Salah Hormazi at all. He's not spoken since the Tattersall's email came out on Friday. Uh, and obviously it's not just Tats, it's Goffs and it's Arcana and it's Keeneland that are involved in this. Um, so transparency has to be better. And, and it goes for who's selling horses as well. You know, there needs to be a clearer, um, a clearer passage, a clearer um, statement of who is selling horses and who's buying horses. It's just this sort of smoke and mirrors theatre, or oh, I'm not going to tell you, or you'll just have to wait and see. It's all like it's all a bit silly, really, isn't it? I mean, we get into a point where it's it's daft, and you know, it only it only extends it only extends this situation. I mean, I don't know when we would have found out about the non-payment of these horses if we weren't pushing to find out whether these horses have been paid for or not. You know, we we, we were pushing for, for these rumours, and you know, the, the 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 email came out around the same time as we were pushing for it. So it doesn't it seems coincidental or not coincidental. To me that, that this is this has happened at the same time so would it have all been done behind closed doors would we have known and it had just rocked up at some point that these horses are in different ownership um so that that can't be right and in terms of self-regulation i mean the sales companies are big and they're very successful uh, there's lots of very diligent hard-working clever talented people that are at these places but they are a bit of a throwback still they do kind of run as little fiefdoms almost um, the BHA have regulation of the bloodstock sector to an extent, but they actually regulate the bloodstock code rather than the sales industry. Um, you've got the bloodstock industry forum that's supposed to act as some sort of um, venue for things to be discussed. But again, it's a bit, it's a bit too involved. It's a bit too of a, of a old boys club almost. Um, you could do with an independent chair of that as a starting point. Um, I would say, I would say, independent chair for a bit for the BIF. Um, I would reconsider the levels of credit that these places are, are extending. Um, and like I said, if if they don't learn from something like this, then like what hope have you got really? Couldn't agree more, Pete. Thank you uh, for talking about that big, big revelation uh, we've had in recent days, and there'll be more on that over the coming days, no doubt from Pete in the Racing Post. Also likely more, no doubt, in the coming days, weeks, months, years, decades. On the whip, the latest instalment came last week. Jonathan Harding, do tell. Yeah, the whip's a topic that just never seems to go away in racing and rears its ugly head every so often. And this is a situation entirely of British racing's own making. So as you know, that we had the whip steering group that proposed some recommendations for the future use of the whip in the sport. which Cross industry steering cross group. Cross industry yeah. steering group with trainers, jockeys, you name it, they were on there. They came up with recommendations in July. They were then set to be implemented uh, quite quickly after that. And on Wednesday, the BHAs made sort of last minute changes to those rules after some uproar from jockeys, namely, um, this idea of being able to use the, uh, where well, they ban the use of the, or proposing to ban the use of the whip in the forehand position, which they've now adjusted. And as a sort of consequence of that, uh, if you want that, we'll take this scenario. They've lowered the uh, stroke count or the, the amount you're able to use the whip. From uh, seven to six from now. From seven to six, yeah. 
So basically, and beefed up the penalties. And beefed up the penalties. Yeah, you're right. So it's basically a situation where we've had these proposals come in just as they're about to. Seemingly, everyone's happy with them publicly. Just as they're about to be implemented, the jockeys have spoken out and said, actually, no, we're not remotely happy with them. I'm slightly torn on this issue because I'm. I like the fact that their BHA and Co were able to say, let's sit down and talk about it. Nothing's been done yet. Let's, if you're not happy, that's okay. I wish you'd said it a little bit sooner, but let's talk about it and adjust them accordingly. So there's a bit of flexibility there, which perhaps we haven't seen previously. But the whole saga, I'm not sure anybody comes out of it particularly well, and not least the, the PJA, who presumably have publicly supported the recommendations originally and have then had their members speaking kind of without their representation and very publicly taking issue with them right at the 11th hour. And it sort of suggests to me that perhaps they don't or haven't represented the views of their members effectively enough to the BHA during this process. But I think it's a, it's a sort of wait and see brief now to see whether the new rules are going to be accepted and sort of bed in. But the, the, the feeling is that a compromise has been reached, so we'll have to see how they, um, how they work in practice. It's a fascinating development, this, and it's one that people have got different views on. Um, we've had a, a few Racing Post columns since this all um, kicked off again last week, and we haven't all agreed. I, I know Chris Cook, who's regularly on this programme, he was very critical of the BHA for its role in the process. I was more critical of uh, jockeys and the PJ in my column today. I can absolutely understand why jockeys... Um, have expressed real concern about the the old proposed forehand ban and i can see why when they were trying it in practice it wasn't working so they felt they they wanted to say something and you had bha stewards in recent weeks saying to them, under the new rules you will get this punishment for doing that i can see all that i think that's perfectly fair and i'm not a jockey i don't feel qualified to say whether the forehand should be banned or not so i, I, I wouldn't have a, a view on that per se, but I do, as I say in the piece, find it maddening that these proposals uh, were announced, or these, these rules were announced in July, and all through the, the, the weeks and months thereafter and before, you had the PGA liaising with its members, you had two very senior jockeys, Tom Scudamore and PJ McDonald, on the steering group, who spoke subsequently very eloquently about why they believe the forehand ban was the right thing to do. The forehand ban proposal was raised to the group from among participants. So it wasn't one that was dropped on participants from outside parties. And it just seems to me an example of how, w w with this sort of situation, um, jockeys, any participant, anyone who's involved really, has to be active on it from, from word go. There was a very high profile, profile jockey who was involved in, from word go, but too many seem to have waited a few months mm. before taking an interest. And that's led to a situation whereby you've had this uh, reversal of policy, U-turn, whatever you want to call it, but that in itself has angered two uh, high profile groups. World Horse Welfare, whose chief exec, Rodeo, was, was on the steering group, he, he is relations with, with the BHA have been badly damaged by this and the RSPCA, RSPCA have been very critical as well and although the RSPCA is I think from our perspective in, race, in, in the racing world an increasingly uh, discredited group it's still a group that a lot of people out there in, in, the, in the real world if the RSPCA starts having a pop at racing regularly they will they will think that's relevant they'll think that's important and they'll, they'll, they'll have concerns for horse racing so there are consequences of this Bill, do you think it raises questions about um, race and governance going forward? Because, I, I, again, I made the point in the piece that generally race courses are pretty good at presenting a united voice on, on matters. On this occasion, the participants haven't been as good at doing that. Um, yeah. I don't know if you, if you remember my, when I made my debut Go on, on this programme in November. I said that... There's a plaque outside. Uh, absolutely. Mm. I, I, I said at the time I didn't think that the... We talked about the whip, and I, mm. I said at the time I didn't think it would be smooth sailing. Yeah. Um, I don't think you need to be a Paul Keeley uh, level of tipster to be able to to have been able to yeah. expect that. Um, I think I, I I I would be on the on the the side of wondering what the PJA have been doing, and it and we've we've sort of had a lesson of this in. In, 
in 2011, when the, the previous time the, the WIP rules were changed, and an announcement was made, lots of comments from various people in the sport saying, you know, these are sensible rules, we'll, this will help um, settle the issue. And in 2011, the whole thing blew up horribly. Um, I thought that those lessons might have been learned, and I think the BHA did learn them in the announcement this time. But again, we get to the business end and, and, and the jockeys are saying that, that this doesn't work. Um, I do think that there is obviously an issue with, with the PJA and the, and the jockeys and getting the views of um, a large number of people with a, who are not you know, time rich. They're all, they're all very busy people. Um, and the, the, the consultation process is, has obviously just not worked within the PJA. I've got to say, I do wonder, I mean, Paul Struthers, if Paul Struthers was still at the PGA, he um, was at the BHA in 2011 mm. when the, the previous rules uh, controversy happened. And so he'd read, if, I'm sure if Paul Struthers was still at the PGA, he would, have, he would have been in a position, he would have known the potential pitfalls. And I just wonder whether, um, having lost Paul Struthers, whether the PGA has the has the the expertise um, and the knowledge of, of what had gone before um, and th maybe this could have been preempted I mean Del, Del Gibson the PJ's racing director um, has been quoted afterwards um, and he's spoken he, he's made clear that you know there has been a lot of communication um, with jockeys but this is not Dale speaking, obviously you can't make jockeys take an interest mm. in something until they want to take an interest in something. On this occasion it's too late. And we need some but benefit of the doubt as well, I think, with jockeys, because I think it was slightly, I think that point was slightly over laboured when they said, well you've had since July, why haven't you said anything? But I suppose they only really started sort of trialling it and getting the feedback a few weeks before they spoke out, if you see what I mean. So I'm not sure it was entirely, it wasn't a case of their twiddling their thumbs all summer and thinking we're going to criticise this right at the 11th hour and try and be really disruptive. I think it was, it, I think genuinely believe it did dawn on a few senior figures in the weighing room how big an adjustment it was going to be and practically it wasn't going to work. But at the same time I'm amazed that nobody saw it coming before that, you know, in those summer months. And why was that feedback being given so close to the implementation period? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, and, and so, so you, you're, you're more critical of the organisation than, it, than its members. Bill, it sounds like you are as, as well. It's an organisation who's got a chief executive who hasn't been very um, visible in, 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 on, a, on a lot of fronts. We don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't hear about him as much as we do uh, chief execs from other racing organisations. Is, is that an issue? Uh, yes, I'd say so. Um, I think... Um, Ian McMahon. Yeah, Ian McMahon hasn't been... You know, I've... As an industry editor, I, he's somebody I should, be, you know, I should know well. But I've only, you know, met, I think I've only met him on the one occasion. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm sure he's doing a lot of work behind the scenes. But it would be nice to know. He, it would be nice for him to have a more public profile. Um, Pete, what, what's your take on it? Are you are you glass half full and saying that here was a, uh, a hotly disputed subject at which, following um, friendly negotiations between two sides? A compromise has been reached, or do you feel it was a bit of a mess? This is my reaction, Lee. Oh, <laughs> um, for, that, for those listening on the podcast, Pete just placed his head <laughs> in his hands. Um, I just I, to sort of to, to build on what the guys are talking about. What is the end game of this? What, 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 where are we trying to get to? We're, we're obviously we're talking about the revisions and the late changes and the. And the drama and the silliness and not quite much. But where, where are we going to get to with a whip in racing by by doing any of this? What what what, what do we think? What's the what's the outcome of this? What you know? Are, are we are we just getting ourselves all, all heads up now? But actually, it's going to work, or is this just ch changing around, chipping away, and, and making it to a position whereby in another ten years? Um, after there's been a couple of high-profile bans or disqualifications, and the anti-forum is 
ripping up and spectator levels are still going down and we think do you know what we need to sort out the whip again let's go back in where where are we going to get to on this lee what lee and and bill and john what what's the what do we think everyone's trying to achieve by doing this well, it's, it's a fair question and you, you could ask the same question of racing authorities all over the world because this the same conversation is taking place in a lot of jurisdictions um i mean do do we think that these sort of rules will ultimately help to save the whip and keep it in horse racing or are they part of its journey towards extinction there's two schools of thought isn't there i mean i'm there's there's people who would say why are we making a rod for our own backs why are we conceding ground to people who are never going to be happy with the whip and are never or, and ultimately gunning for racing why are we kind of putting our own nails in the coffin as it were but then the other school of thought and the one that I personally subscribe to is the idea that it's better to tweak and be proactive and show a willingness to at least consider the optics and the and the changing societal attitudes on your own terms rather than ultimately be dictated down the line after years of being stubborn and I think this was a very well-intentioned project. I think the, the perception of the whip by broader society is very important. I think it's an, an important conversation to have, but for a project that was ultimately designed to improve optics, it's, had, it's looked terrible over the last few months. It just reeks of mismanagement. It looks like a very badly handled situation. And I think it's probably caused more damage than good, ultimately, but I, Personally, I think it was well intentioned, and I think it is a conversation that needs to carry on about the whip. And just finally, Bill, the proof of the pudding is in the racing. Um, the, there are much stiffer penalties now for jockeys who break the rules, and they were they were made stiffer to still as a result of the forehand ban um, being reversed, and the thresholds have come down. Everyone will be looking towards the Cheltenham Festival and those four days, and what happens there. Would you be pretty confident? that the whip won't explode as a story across those four days, given how much focus there will be on it and given how often jockeys will be told going into the festival, look, these are the new thresholds, you can't go over these. I'd be, I'd be hopeful it, it, it won't become a, a, a massive issue, which is probably a hostage to fortune, but I, I think jockeys are, are well aware that it's you know, very much in their hands now. Yeah. And I think as a collective, they, they will know that um, they can't risk this blowing up again. And as a collective, jockeys have also, since this uh, all took place last week, they've been, as a collective, said that they agree with the new rules. They're not, they're not um, angered by the stiffer penalties and they will uh, be well aware of their responsibilities to the sport. So uh, fingers crossed we get a good Cheltenham Festival and in a wider sense, a good 2023 build because across the last week, the Racing Post had three days of features on a year to save racing, looking at big issues facing the sport, things like affordability checks, racing's governance and falling attendances on race goers. This is your story. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it seems that, you know, at the start of every year, we, we say this is you know, going to be a pivotal year for, for British racing. But I think this really, really is a, 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 a pivotal year, um, as, as last week's series set out, which yourself and, and Jonathan would, um, contributed to with the, uh, the three pieces. So... We've got um, we've got the issue of governance and the industry st strategy, um, the sport coming together uh, in order to find a way of um, st uh, stopping the 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 slide towards uh, uh, horses going abroad, um, uh, trying to sort the, the prize money issue, um, coming up with a, a strategy that will improve the the product that people are. Uh, bet on and that, pe that people want to go to see on, on race courses. Um, obviously, with this, the issue of affordability checks, um, which is a sort of double edged sword, really, in that we've got the, we're still waiting for the government's get, uh, white paper on the, following the, the gambling. Any review. thoughts about when it might come out? Um, they're, they're back from, MPs are back uh, today, yeah. uh, Monday, from their Christmas holidays. Um, the the last thing that sort of people who would know about these things were saying to me was they were thinking possibly February now this year yes yeah. <laughs> yes this year yeah um, so the, we we want to see what the what the government's going to say about affordability checks 
Um, and the indications are that they don't want um, punters to have to give uh, very personal details about yeah. their finances. But the, the, the other side of the sword is that all the bookmakers are already introducing these affordability checks and they're already having a, a pretty uh, major effect, if you, according to some Huge effect, yeah. Um, and then, obviously, we're looking at how, to, how racing can, can maintain its place in a very competitive sort of leisure scene um, where, you've, where you've, the people are you know, facing rising costs um, and an increasing number of ways that they can spend what little money they might have left after paying their energy bills and how racing can, can, can maintain its place there, but also how it can attract younger, a, a younger audience, which is um, uh, the figures in, in, in the piece that you did. It, it is a worry that the, uh, a younger demographic isn't as into racing as, as we would hope. Yeah, and even that younger demographic, if they do, young people who, do, who bet on racing, the percentage of their, of their betting on racing is much less that it would be for an older person who bets on racing as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, speaking now as a, a middle-aged man, um, when I was first starting off having a bet, um, you know, the football, you couldn't have a single bet on a, on a football match unless it was on the television, I think. Yeah. Um, it's all multiples, wasn't it? Uh, exactly. And now you can bet in play on hundreds of markets mm. in each football match. Um, and, you know, betting on f football is a much simpler process and maybe not as skillful but um, uh, in some cases but it's it's a much simpler process than um, than going through a form book it's it's um, it's a tricky one and one that finer minds than me have, have found difficult to sort out <laughs> in the past uh, Jonathan you were focusing on affordability checks in your piece if we you know the the, 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 the theme of the series of a year to save racing it asks a question do you think as we get through 2023 um, we will end up in a better position than we fear on affordability checks or are you pretty glum? Well it's, it's difficult because everybody's waiting to see aren't they? Everyone is still trying to learn what's going to be in that white paper exactly and you can extrapolate from various extremes if affordability checks were to come in in their absolute strictest form so let's say losses of £100 a month it would be catastrophic the feeling, as Bill quite rightly says, is that it's not going to be quite that bad. And from the people I've spoken to, which includes uh, David Armstrong at the RCA, that the sense is that it may not, the consequence of this may not be quite as bad as we first feared. It's still going to be a massive blow, I think, whatever form affordability checks take in the white paper. But I'm, I'm more optimistic is completely the wrong word. I, I'm not. The sense is it's perhaps not going to be a fatal blow, which is a very low bar to set when you're going into a situation. <laughs> but uh, look, we're just we're going to have to wait and see. It's, there's going to be significant pain. Yeah, that, that is for sure. Yeah, it does seem like that. Um, Pete, what did you take from this series? And maybe if we just reference the the, the popularity piece, um, speaking to people like uh, Rod Street and Joe Sormer Smith, in that they were highlighting the fact that the the sport uh, needs to attract a more diverse audience, a younger audience. It needs to really make the most of its, its human and equine stars in a way that it maybe hasn't done before now. And also, we need to find much, much more money to market this sport. Are they all points that you'd agree with? Yes. Good. <laughs> Isn't it? It's simple. Like, in, in the end, all of these things are, are true. It's having the, the nous and the desire and the drive to do it. I mean, we've got this new governance structure in place that Bill's done so much good reporting on. Um, but, you, you know, we need to see these people working together and coming up with this strategy and getting us into a position where all of these desires, all of these wants, all of these conversations we've had over many years about there not being enough prize money and, you know, all the horses going off to Hong Kong and Australia and all of this kind of stuff starts being conversations that we all know the situation about. And instead, we've got something in place. To, well, look, it's not going to change overnight. It's not going to be some sort of utopia tomorrow, is it? That's that's not going to happen. But like, we all know the problems. We all have an idea of where we need to go and the sort of people we need to come in. Um, 
nobody really should be resistant to change, although the uh, grand idea that everyone's going to work together and all share in the pain is, is somewhat ambitious, I would say. Give Bill plenty of things to write about um, over the coming months, I'd have, I'd have thought, you know, a little bit of conflict here and there. But, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's it, nothing has particularly changed in terms of what we need to do. We just kind of need to do it, don't we? Yeah, I think so. I, I thought one of the... The, 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 the line that struck me most in the piece I did on, on, on popularity was Joe Sormer Smith, the BHA chair, saying that he regularly asks people he's speaking to what percentage of children uh, in schools under the age of 16 in England and Wales are non-white. And he says very few people even get to double digits and the answer is 34%. And he says that all those who say the BHA is obsessed with diversity and inclusion and that is a bad thing are in effect saying that we're, we, we don't want the sport to go after that third of the population that in future will, that could be making up our race goers, our owners, our trainers, our jockeys, our punters. It's, a, it's, an obvious, it's an obvious win for racing if we can have some success on that front. Just one final question on this one then, Bill. Mm-hmm. Um, as Pete says, you're, you're generally not short of things to write about. As we get to the end of 2023, do you think racing in Britain will be in a better position than it is now? Well, that's a, a, a nice, easy question for yes. me to answer. Um, I hope so, but I, 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 have, I have concerns. Um, I mean, in terms of, uh, of the governance and the industry strategy, um, I, I would like to see what happens when push comes to shove on, on things. You, I mean, the, in, in, in Chris's piece, uh, Chris Cook's piece last week about he had quoted David Armstrong talking about the fixture list, and and you know we we might not need to uh, cut fixtures. Um, and I don't know, maybe he's, maybe he's right, but it just seems to be you know it is a the the fixture list and the size of it does seem to remain a sort of a a red line for the, for the, for the race courses. And uh, if if BHA and others want to make radical changes. Will that be, uh, for 2024, will that be able to happen? Um, in terms of affordability checks, um, my, my worry is that the government will, because this is a very difficult subject, um, it is, you know, to, to resolve. Um, how do you make sure that people don't spend too much money that they can't afford to on, on gambling without uh, intruding on the, you know, the, the vast majority of people who, who can who bet perfectly reasonably within the, within their means, I, my fear would be that the government uh, passes the book on this yeah. and it goes to the gambling commission, um, which wouldn't be good news. Not necessarily. No, no. They're not sort of judged on on the form book so far. No. No. Um, big questions then facing the sport in 2023. The big question facing this particular program now is: I have to decide who had the winning front page story in this edition. And I'm going to say it's actually, I think, a, 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 an easier one uh, for me than for British racing. Um, gentlemen, you both presented excellent stories. Jonathan the Whip, huge. It will continue to be huge, even though we would wish it not to be huge. Um, Bill, Year to Save Racing, excellent series. Um, raises huge questions for the sport. Um, and we'll hopefully get some good answers as the year goes on. But such were the eye-watering numbers in the story about Sally al non-payment of uh, 20 million plus for those horses. I think what was essentially my story, but actually Pete, is your story. It's all your story. You, Pete Scargill, are the winner this week. Congratulations, sir. Thank you, Lee. We'll share the credit on this one as you drafted me in at the last minute to present your case. It's uh, a a team win. Beautiful words there to end the show from Peter Scargill. Actually, the show hasn't ended quite yet because I need to tell you, uh, as I've told you in previous episodes, but it's entirely true, you really should be, must be, downloading our new Racing Post app, exclusive content from the biggest names, great writing, great tipping, great reasons for you using the Racing Post app all through 2023 and beyond. That brings us to the end of a bumper edition full of big stories. Thank you to Peter Scargill, to Jonathan Harding, to Bill Barber. Thank you to you for watching. We'll see you again next week. Until then, bye-bye.